All right, good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Philip Bloom. I'm the curator of the Chinese Garden here at the Huntington. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to this evening's conversation among Nathan Wong, Lisa C, and my colleague, Li Wei Yang. Um, thank you all very much for being here. Um, I'd like to express my particular gratitude to the Chung Family Foundation for establishing the endowment that's made tonight's event possible. So one of the many pleasures of my job as curator of the Chinese Garden is that I get to oversee an artist's residency program. Thanks to the generous support of the Chung Family Foundation, each year the Huntington's able to bring one artist to the Chinese Garden to help us continually enliven and reinterpret that space. The Pipa Virtuoso Wu Man inaugurated the residency in 2014. She created a composition that she and two other musicians from the Silk Road Ensemble performed live in the garden. In 2018, Stan Lai, uh, Lai Sheng Chuan, a playwright who works in Taiwan and in the US, created Nightwalk, a site-specific work of theater that combined 16th century Chinese opera with the history of the Huntington itself. And this year, I'm absolutely thrilled that Nathan Wong is our 2022-2023 Chung Family Foundation visiting artist in the Chinese Garden. Yes. <laughs> And tonight's conversation actually publicly marks the official beginning of his residency. So over the next year, he will not only restage the opera on Gold Mountain that you'll hear about this evening, but he's also going to workshop a new work of musical theater that's tentative, tentatively titled Shanghai. That will be in May of 2023. His residency will also include some wonderful family and educational programs along the way. Nathan Wong, as probably many of you know, is an extraordinarily versatile and successful composer. After graduating first from USC as a precocious 13-year-old, and later from Pomona as a still precocious 20-something, he turned down Harvard Medical School and instead headed to Oxford University. Since then, he's written music for everything from Steven Spielberg documentaries to Jackie Chan comedies, as well as animated features and television series. He's worked with Disney, DreamWorks, China Film Group, Sony, and many other uh, production companies. He's created off-Broadway musicals. He's written operas. His compositions have been performed by the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and the Shanghai Philharmonic. He's won two Emmys. He even won a Singapore Grammy with my favorite Chinese pop star, Fei Wang. If you speak with him, um, you wouldn't know any of this. He's one of the most pleasant, humble, upbeat people I know. Whenever I meet with Nathan, I feel infinitely better about the world and its humans. Tonight, uh, Nathan will be joined in conversation by his longtime collaborator, Lisa C. Lisa is, to put it simply, an incredible writer. She's the New York Times best-selling author of numerous novels, including The Tea Girl, of Hummingbird Lane, Peony and Love, Shanghai Girls, and Dreams of Joy. Her books have been translated into 38 different languages and are beloved worldwide. Before devoting herself to her career as a novelist, she worked in journalism, serving as publisher, Publishers Weekly's uh, West Coast correspondent, writing freelance for Vogue, Self, and many national book reviews. She's curated many exhibitions, she sits on the boards of a number of nonprofits, and she's been a very generous benefactor to the Huntington and other organizations in Southern California. But as everyone knows, the project that's bringing us all together tonight is On Gold Mountain, a project that began as the remarkable memoir that Lisa C. wrote about her Chinese-American family's settlement in Los Angeles. In the late 1990s, she and Nathan developed an opera of the same name, uh, which premiered at the Aratani Theater in Little Tokyo in 2000. Now the Huntington is proud to collaborate with LA Opera in restaging the opera this spring. It will be performed outdoors in the Chinese Garden for eight nights from May 5th to 15th. And I guarantee it will be absolutely spectacular. I'm particularly grateful to my colleague, Sian Adams, for spearheading and tirelessly supporting this wonderful partnership. If you received a little info um, 
thing about on Gold Mountain, you probably received it from Sian this evening. So please thank her on the way out for actually making the opera happen. Nathan and Lisa will join us on stage to share some thoughts about On Gold Mountain in just a couple of minutes. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Li Wei Yang, the curator of Pacific Rim collections in the Huntington Library. Um, Li Wei holds an MA in history from the University of Edinburgh and a Master of Library Science from San Jose State University. He is an expert in Asian American history, particularly um, the immigration of Chinese and Japanese people to Southern California. And he's really been instrumental in opening the Huntington to a very different perspective on American history. And he's really transformed the institution, I think, into a leading archive for Asian American uh, materials. Li Wei will get the evening started by introducing some of the important intersections between On Gold Mountain and the Huntington's collections. In fact, thanks to Lisa C., Leslie Leung, and many other members of their fam extended family, the Huntington now holds a treasure trove of archival materials and photographs that document the history of Los Angeles's Chinatowns. After this introduction to the collections, Li Wei will moderate the conversation between Nathan and Lisa and the evening will conclude with a special preview of some of the music from On Gold Mountain. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Li Wei Yang. Great. Welcome everyone to the Huntington on the occasion of the conversation between Nathan Wong and Lisa C on the making of On Gold Mountain as an outdoor opera in the Chinese garden. At the core of this production, there are multiple collections of primary source materials that anchor the story, such as handwritten letters, immigration papers, photographs, and other documents that capture the history of this multi-generational Chinese-American story. Most of the collections are now preserved as part of the Huntington's Pacific Rim collection, and they're essential to the library's mission to grow, diversify, and expand access to our rare holdings. My first meeting with Lisa C. and her cousin, Leslie C. Leon, was back in 2011, when they visited the Huntington to look at Fang Xi's immigration files in the Y.C. Hong collection. The file shows Fang Xi leveraging his Chinese merchant status to bring one of his wives, Nong Hong, and their children to the United States from China in 1936. During the Chinese execution era, immigration was difficult to say the least and Fang Xi and his attorney had to supply documents such as business shareholder lists, affidavits, and personal biographical information to affirm he and his family's rights to be in the United States. It was through this meeting, and many more since, that I got to know Lisa, Leslie, and their incredible collections of early Chinese American history that spans, that spans across China, Sacramento, and Los Angeles. In early 2020, Leslie donated the Gilbert, Florence, and Leslie C. Leon collection, which contains the bulk of the C. and Leon family history. Later that year, Lisa donated the Lisa C. collection that contains hundreds of unique glass plate negatives of LA Old Chinatown from the 1890s to the 1900s. The story of the C. family in the United States started in the 1860s when Fang C.'s father, Fang Dunxun came to the United States during the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1867. Fang worked alongside Chinese railroad workers as an herbalist, providing much needed traditional Chinese remedy to the workers who didn't have access to medical doctors. And after the completion of the railroad, Fang opened an herbal shop in Sacramento, California. In 1874, Fang Xi made his way to the United States in search of his father. Soon after their reunion, Fang Dunxuan returned to China, and Fang Xi and his brothers worked in various odd jobs before becoming a small manufacturer producing ladies' underwear. It was around this time that Fang Xi met his future wife, Latisi Pruitts, and the two were married and moved to Los Angeles, where they reopened F Sui One in downtown LA specializing in Chinese and Japanese antiques. The C. Leon collection contains a wealth of materials on the F. Sui One operation. As one of the most prominent Asian antique businesses in Southern California, 
FSUI 1 cultivated Americans' fascination with Asian heritage materials and shaped their taste for antiques through the discriminating eyes of Fang Xi and Tai Xi. Coupled by the advancement in transportation technology and the relative ease of importing cultural treasures from China, this was indeed the golden era of Asian, Asian antique merchandising that propelled FSUI 1 to become one of the most successful businesses in early LA Chinatown. Under the shadow of its exclusion, Asian American artists struggled to find venues to showcase their talents. In 1935, the C family opened Dragon's Den restaurants in the basements of F Suite One. In addition to selling Chinese American classic dishes such as chop suey and egg fu yang, Dragon's Den dedicated its space to showing works by Tyrus Wong, Benji Okubo, and many other young Asian American artists. The restaurant became a popular hangout spot for Hollywood celebrities, artists, and creative individuals. Tyrus Wong worked there as a waiter, met his future wife, Ruth Kim, designed two murals for the restaurants, and created these gorgeous menu covers that are now preserved in the C. Leon collection. In 2020, the donation of the Lisa C. collection gave the Huntington and researchers never before seen images of Los Angeles' old Chinatown the most historic Chinese-American community in Los Angeles that was demolished to make way for Union Station in the 1930s. As the name suggests, glass plate negatives use glass as a medium to capture sharp and detailed images when light is focused through the lens and lands on light-sensitive materials. This breakthrough technology was also the first economically durable photographic medium that popularized photography like never before. The image that you are seeing on the right is the negative, which contained the negative image on the piece of glass measured at roughly five by seven. On the left is the photo image taken with a high-res camera and digitally converted into the positive. Lisa C's family saved these glass plates from trash in the 1940s, and the Huntington's team of archivists and conservators are now working to preserve, catalog, and digitize the hundreds of images in this amazing collection. These unique images help contextualize on Gold Mountain's setting through their street photography and studio portraits that capture the humanity and streetscape of LA Old Chinatown. They also show the vibrancy of one of the largest Chinese American communities that grew, prospered, and ultimately declined under the shadow of the Chinese Exclusion Act. We do not know the identities of the photographers yet or why the photographs were taken. But we're grateful to Lisa and her family for safekeeping these rare artifacts for over 80 years and entrusting them to the Huntington. By the end of this year, the first group of these photos will be cataloged, digitized, and made available to the public on the Huntington Digital Library. You will also see some of the photos incorporated into the opera. Thank you very much. Uh, now for the next segments, I will be your moderator for the conversation between Nathan Wong and Lisa C. And we will also save some time for you to ask questions from the audience toward the end of the segment, followed by a performance by Nathan Wong on piano and members of the LA Opera. But for now, let us give a big welcome to the Chang Foundation artist in residence, Nathan Wong, and best-selling author, Lisa C. So I'm going to start off the conversation by asking, uh, when Gold Mountain came out in 1995 and became a bestseller, what was the inspiration in turning it into an opera? And what connected you two to become creative partners during the process? Well, first, I just want to say it actually didn't become a bestseller for 18 years. <laughs> so that in itself is pretty remarkable. That doesn't happen very often. Uh, but it did do very well. I'm not saying it was. So um, going way back in time, I'm, I'm a pretty shy person, but I do love opera. And I had been, go my husband and I had been going to uh, LA Opera for several years. And we were invited to an event at the opera shop, uh, at the opera costume shop. And like I said, I'm, I'm really very shy. And my husband's pretty shy. And we were just being a couple of wall 
flowers. And this woman came up and started talking to us, and she was very, very nice. She turned out to be the wife of the then director of the opera, uh, Peter Hemmings. And as a thank you for her being so nice, I sent her a copy of the book. And the next time my husband and I went to the opera, she, they came running up to me and said, we've got an idea. And then the next thing I knew, I was introduced to Nathan, and we spent a lot of months working together to, right. um, for me to write the libretto and for Nathan to compose the music. Anything from you, Nathan? Exactly what Lisa said. Uh, we were sort of put together, and uh, she came over to my house and introduced the idea of writing the music for On Gold Mountain of her book. And a couple weeks later, she showed me the libretto, and I looked at it, and I thought it was super, super fascinating. Being a Chinese American, it really hit home. My parents are from Shanghai. My grandparents were from Hong Kong. So it was really something that I could relate to. And uh, I think we kind of clicked. And it really didn't take me that long to write the music. I think I was so inspired that after three or four months, we pretty much had it, I think. Yeah, and actually, Nathan, I think that um, there were some things, pieces of music that you wrote first, and some pieces of the libretto that I wrote first, and then there were things where we were sitting together on the piano bench. That's right, to and it, it, was out. A, it was a true collaboration, and that's what I really love about working with people who I really like, and also people who are talented, who can put something down and be able to feel as though, ah, I'm getting inspired, and this is really going to push me forward in trying to write the best kind of music that I could. And I did definitely feel that with On Gold Mountain. So as part of the production, you are working with a group of musicians from LA Opera Orchestra, but then you're also working with a group of student mus musicians from the nearby local areas. Can you tell us what is that like working with students on this project, and how have the students responded to working with a world-class composer such as yourself? <laughs> well, I had the same opportunity 20 years ago. Uh, when this happened, uh, Peter Hemmings, as Lisa said, the artistic director at LA Opera, said, what we really want this to be is an outreach to the community. And so we want the involvement of people who can sing, people who can play instruments. And so they put us together with high school students, and I think at that time, college students as well. And we also had our Union Local 47 professional musicians. And we did that. And that was quite an experience. And this time, I kind of knew what we were getting into. Same kind of deal. High school students, in particular, plus the local 47 professional musicians, this time from LA Opera Orchestra. So it's really going to be, I think, a wonderful, wonderful experience to be able to stand up there and conduct high school students, as well as professionals. And it really is thrilling, because it's fulfilling what Peter Hemming saw 20 years ago, which is putting these high school students alongside professional musicians so that they can really understand the, the career that they might be getting into and hopefully inspired by it. And may I just say similarly with the, um, all of the, the voice people, uh, singers, otherwise known as. <laughs> um, we have uh, professional um, singers, we have semi-professional, we have uh, voice students, and then we have a chorus that comes from the community. And so again, it, it's sort of taking that same idea of having professional and, and semi-professional and people who really want this as their life and their future, to be working side by side. I haven't been able to go to all of the rehearsals, but um, there was the first one that I went to uh, was the first time that the orchestra and the chorus were in the same room together. And you know, we're all wearing masks, everybody's wearing masks there, because it, except for the, um, the woodwind type. Yes, they, they had to they, they can't have their mask on. <laughs> um, but I, and I was sitting at the back of the room, and to just see these, everybody's just like leaning forward towards Nathan, just so excited and so engaged. And I, I hope that that's, uh, you know, that that inspires them as they move forward. And, and again, even for the singers as well. And this next question is for Lisa. Uh, since the first production of Uncle Mountain in 2000, I think for this edition, we have introduced 
archival collections into the production as well too. Can you talk a little bit about the photos from the Lisa C collection, from the C. Leon collection? How are they being incorporated into the production? And maybe you can also talk a little bit about how you, your, you and your family uh, came to save these uh, important photographs so that we can see them today. Right, I'll talk about those glass plates first. Um, so my grandparents kept everything. If they saw something by the side of the road, they picked it up and brought it home. Because <laughs> you never know, a piece of used electrical conduit, you know, it might come in handy one day. And so when old Chinatown was being torn down and our family business was there, uh, my father and grandfather just went scavenging. And they brought home clothes and toys and just all kinds of stuff, including this big crate of glass plate negatives. And they put it all in a shed, and it all stayed in there for about 50 years. And then after my grandmother died, I was the one who got to go in there and try to figure it all out. And so I've had those glass plates at my home for, I guess it was, what did we decide, 26 years. I live in a fire area, and in the last couple of years, or four years, I guess, we had to evacuate twice. And the last fire, we had 12 houses burn on our street. And um, for those of you who live in fire areas, you know, we keep, I hope you keep this, a list of what you're supposed to take. You know, we just have it ready, so if it's three in the morning, we can pull it out. And that box of glass plates has been at the very top of the list above anything else in our home or in our lives because I knew that they were irreplaceable and that really no one else had ever seen them. It, for at least a hundred years. <laughs> and so it, after that last fire, it really became important to me to make sure that they got to a safe place where they would be cared for and where scholars and students and eventually the public would be able to see them. So uh, with this production, our director, Jennifer Chang, she, they're going to be doing these um, rear screen projections and, and that will help to tell the story, not just of my family, but of the larger, Chi of larger Chinese American history, particularly in California and even more particularly here in Los Angeles. And so they've drawn very heavily from the Huntington's existing collection uh, with you know, images from the railroad, uh, from the gold fields, all, all of that stuff plus having the uh, images, not just of photographs, but other kinds of archival material, again, to help from my cousin's collection and then also these glass plate negatives to help tell the larger story. And Nathan, um, I wanted to know more about your own family history, uh, being a Chinese American, being a second generation Chinese American. Uh, do you identify with any of the characters or any of the storylines within On Gold Mountain? Interesting question. Well, let me get, let's just go ahead and delve into my family history. I found out that my great grandfather was actually someone from China who then went to Australia to be a cowboy. Wore a cowboy hat and was just yeehaw and just having fun in the countryside in Australia. And then apparently he got together with a couple of his Chinese friends in Australia and said, let's start a department store. And that's exactly what he did. They went back to Shanghai and he became the sole owner of a, of a company called Daishan Gongxi, which is, or which was, the Macy's of China. Or, yes, actually of China. But it was, it was situated in Shanghai. And it literally was the biggest department store in China. And in fact, if you go back to China now, in Shanghai, you'll still see the same department store. And it's called the number one department store because it's so big. And you can't miss it. It's right on the bun. And that's where my grandfather started. And it was, it was a huge place. And back in the 1930s, you can understand you know, Shanghai's sort of background. You know, you had, it, was, it was very political, a lot of shady things happening, and he was basically right in the middle of it. And he got to know the mayor and all of that. And um, during World War II, they, my, gra my grandfather turned that department store into a place where they could hide a lot of Jews who were trying, Russian Jews, who were trying to escape from, from Eastern Europe and he'd keep them in the basement. So it's, it's almost like a Schindler's List 
of that's what my grandfather was at that time. But in terms of the department store, uh, it was apparently a wonderful place where the first floor, they would sell a lot of tchotchkes. And then also on the second floor, they would have, um, a, my mother would tell me, she'd always hang out there because it, they would have a candy store. And she being the daughter of the owner, they could all go as daughters and sons and just raid that place every, every time after school. Um, the top floor actually was a nightclub. So it really was sort of a, a, a shopping mall all in one where you could just spend the entire day, spend the entire evening, and have a lot of fun. That's what my background was. And, um, and if you ever do go back to Shanghai, take a look and ask for the number one department store. Tell them I sent you. <laughs> Lisa, um, F. Sui Wan, it's a major setting for the book and also for the opera production. Uh, do you have any memories that you want to share with us growing up with the store and with all the history that came with it? Yeah, I lived with my mother when I was growing up, but I did spend a tremendous amount of time with my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles in the FSOE 1 company in Chinatown. And at that time, it was right across the street. Now you just, it's, this is going to sort of cause an argument in the room, whether you say Felipe's or Philippe's. Uh, <laughs> so it was right across the street behind a moon gate. And um, this was a place that was just so incredible to me. It was in uh, the last remaining building of what had once been China City. And so it had this big central aisle and the little rooms on the sides that were originally little shops in China City that had upturned eaves. And each room had a theme. You know, here was the bronze room, the art room, porcelains, uh, uh, scrolls, jewelry, textiles, you know, every room was a little different. But there were also these sort of hidden nooks and crannies that had these leftover things from China City, the old China City wishing well, the old China City goldfish pond. But it was, and, and of course, literally filled floor to ceiling with all this incredible Chinese art and um, artifacts and carvings and and you know, really big temple carvings and things like that. So it was this really a magical place. But as much as those objects were magical, it was really, t for me, about the people. And to have been able to spend so much time with um, my grandparents, but also my aunts and uncles. So in that picture of my family, my grandfather is the little boy, or is the is the little boy sitting on his father's lap, and my great aunt is the little girl sitting on Ticey's lap. And at the end of the day, they would go to the back of the store, they'd have a drink, I don't know what it was, brown liquor of some sort, you know, and have some snacks, and they would tell these wonderful stories about Fong Si and how he came here alone as a boy of 14, how he you know, used to work in the fields and wash dishes in restaurants, and how he used to sell tickets to see his stuffed mermaid, and oh yes, we still have that somewhere, and you know, first Chinese in America to own an automobile, and how he lived to be 100 years old, and all, just you know, 12 children, and you know, just all this amazing stuff. And those stories were just fascinating to me, um, but they were also fascinating to a lot of other people who had approached the family, you know, over about a hundred years to do a book or a magazine article or even a film script. And always our family had said no. And then finally, uh, my great aunt, you know, said, why don't you come over? I have some stories I want to tell you. And I, I remember that day so clearly because we were in the back of the store, uh, which is now in, has been in Pasadena since the early 1980s. And um, she started telling these stories, things that I had never heard before. That my great-grandfather didn't have two wives, he actually had four. And, <laughs> and kind of in passing, she mentioned a kidnapping. And I had never heard of the kidnapping, and it did take me another two years to get the story of the kidnapping. But, um, you know, I think that that place and those people are the ones who formed me, you know, as a woman, as a mother, as a writer, as how I see the world, as how I see my place in the world. 
And Nathan, you are the 2022-2023 artist in residence at the Huntington. Can you talk about what are some of the more exciting projects that you're working on besides on Gold Mountain? On Gold Mountain is going to be our first project together here uh, at the Huntington, and I'm just so delighted to be the artist in residence here at the Huntington. Thank you so much for that honor. And I'm going to try to bookend it with a musical that I basically just told you about, about my grandfather's department store <laughs> in Shanghai in 1937. So I think it's really going to be very appropriate to be able to kind of hearken back to the sort of those times. It's, it, was a, it, it was almost like the jazz, jazz age of the 20s here in America. Just so exciting to be able to go out and just a lot of, a lot of electricity in the air uh, during that time. And it's going to be about the department store, and I want to try to make it like a Chinese Les Mis, something that's just so dramatic. And I hope you all come and see it. So that, that will hopefully happen in May uh, of next year. But in between, I'm also um, going to be doing a project that we came up with that I am very, very excited about. Um, how many of you out there know Mazorsky's pictures at an exhibition, right? That was uh, a piece that was written by Mussorgsky after he had visited an art exhibition. And he looked at certain pictures and said, wow, that really inspired me. And he'd write an orchestral piece for that picture. And then he'd go and look at another picture and another day. And he came up with, I don't, gosh, I don't remember, but quite a few vignettes of musical pieces. That's what I want to try to do during my stay here. Uh, you know, they have a wonderful collection of immigration letters here at the Huntington. I want to go into their stash and take a look at those letters of people who immigrated from China and see what they had to say. All these families had different experiences coming here. And I want to try to go through them, find the more interesting ones, see which ones inspire me, and write musical pieces for them. Whether they be a piano solo, whether it's a string quartet or a piano trio, I want to see what happens, and that's one of the highlights that I want to try to do. And also to be able to come back here and speak with all of you and tell you more about um, what inspires me to be the artist in residence here. So we have a little time for questions from the audience. And so who wants to be the first brave volunteer to ask the first question? Do I see any hands? I see one back there. Uh, so We'll get, we, can have, we can give you the mic if you just. Is it your uh, maiden name or your? Oops, I forgot. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, we're actually Fongs, but, yeah, um, but my, my great, question. but yeah. my great grandfather was Fong C. Fong, but Fong, so he was the fir fourth brother. Right. So four in Cantonese. And, um, our one line ended up as C's. Everybody else is a Fong. Okay, that answered my question. I was one, I, I, I thought C is his, it was his first name. Yeah. And okay. Yeah, I mean, it was just, he was the fourth son. Okay. So he was just called, you know, number four. Right. We have a lot of those in our family. <laughs> right. <laughs> For some of the early Chinese names and, and, and immigration system here, there was a lot of mixed up because simply because of the uh, misunderstanding between and without the language expertise on the American side. And so a lot of these Chinese names got mixed up when they were coming over to the United States and therefore the Fong and the C eventually got mixed up. So that's why uh, she's called Lisa C today. Right. I mean, uh, there are different versions of the story. One is that, you know, they asked my great great grandfather, where did you come from? And he said, I came from across the sea. That seems a little fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Another is that, you know, again, the immigration saw Fong C and said, oh, C must be the last name. Um, but uh, the other story is that my great-grandmother, who was white, and, you know, they could not be legally married here in California, that she thought that C would protect them would give them a little layer of protection. So it's one or all of those stories. Uh, you, sir? Uh, 
Very good question. I don't know whether you heard it, but what are the similarities and differences of writing film scores versus an opera? First of all, I can say that most of the time when I do a film score, it's usually to the picture. Uh, rarely do I actually work from the script. So instead, uh, when I'm working with uh, a movie score, I'm actually already looking at something. I'm already able to see what the director has, has provided me. On an opera, in an opera, it's totally different because the opera should, needs to be written and then you have to conceive of it from the director's side of that and he or she hasn't had a chance to work with it until we actually sit down, have the cast up there and I get to see it. So that's a very, very big difference. Musically, it has to be written first. And in a way, it's a lot, don't tell directors this, but it's a lot more fun because you are basically playing the director yourself. You are having to conceive of what's going on on the stage and imagine how the interaction's going as opposed to doing a music score, a film score, where you already see what's going on. I see a hand in the back. Yes, what was the uh, catalyst that took your publication 18 years to bestseller status? Uh, you know what that was? They did a special ebook for like $1.99. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and it just shot right. I mean, it was just a weird, fluky thing. But um, yeah, <laughs> e commerce, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm one of the community singers, and I've been rehearsing, and I wanted to thank Nathan for such beautiful music, and Lisa for such a, a beautiful love story. Um, and the, the laborers have such poetry, the way they, they express what's going on. But my question for Lisa is, in one of the scenes, there's gambling, and we sing over and over, four, 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 three, two, one, none. And I was just wondering what that means. It's a, it's a game. It was a game. Was that Fantan? Yes. Yeah, Fantan. It's, so it's, it's, it was a game that was actually very popular back, um, certainly during the railroad days, but even more recently. Uh, and it, and it, it did have this four count to it. Before we go on, I'd like to introduce Steve, who is playing our laborer and man five. So when you come see the opera, you'll see him. There is, I see your hand back there. Hi. Hi. Um, so assuming you get inspired by looking at these various artworks while you're the uh, artist in residence here. Will you possibly, and maybe this is a question for someone else, be doing another lecture or a presentation um, during your time here? The question is, will I be giving more lectures here? Is that yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, this is, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm so glad to see all these new faces, familiar faces, old faces, and uh, faces that I've seen 20 years ago. Uh, it's really, really wonderful uh, to be able to communicate like this, especially after COVID, and to be able to come out and to be able to really interact. And that's one thing I actually want to speak about. This opera has given me an opportunity to work with the cast, people like Steve, to work with high school students, and to work with unbelievable talent when you come out and you hear our principal singers. Uh, it really restores the faith that I have of, of our younger generation, and it reminds me of how respectful we really need to be to our older generation who has brought us into this world. And I think it's very, very important that this kind of story tells us that. And uh, a lot of thanks goes to Lisa for this, this story, which is all about love, really. I mean, when you boil it all down, it really is a story of love, which is basically what opera is all about, right? There's always that story of love. Underneath. But no one dies at the end. Yeah, no one <laughs> dies at the end. Don't True. worry. <laughs> and I really, I no really. No stabbings. <laughs> I, yeah, and I just want to say I really appreciate what you said about it being romantic. I mean, this is a love story between my great grandparents, you know, who faced unbelievable odds. Uh, it's not 
a love story without some bumps and sadness along the way. But from the very beginning, I mean, I'm sure many of you have been to contemporary operas. I love them, so don't get me wrong. I love Philip Glass, so don't get me wrong. But this has music and I will very immodestly say some nice um, lyrics where you will come out humming them, I think. You know, and, and it's very melodious and very rich, the sound, I think. I hope it is. <laughs> what I'd like to do after this is you'll hear me on the piano and you'll have a chance to listen to a little bit of the opera, which I hope encourages you, if you haven't bought your tickets yet, go ahead and, um, and purchase them as soon as you can, and hopefully you'll get inspired to come see it. So we have one hand in the back. Hey, Nathan. Like, uh, my question was, uh, is there like a difference uh, working on like American films when you're scoring versus uh, when you're scoring in China? And do you have any fun Jackie Chan stories you'd like to share? <laughs> Jackie Chan f films are a lot of fun. Can I tell you a little, little story about um, uh, Jackie? He and I became very good friends uh, and after having done two or three of his movies. And there was one time when he called me and, uh, actually there are two stories. The first story, first story, um, he calls me and he says, I'm in town and can you come and I wanna to talk to you about the script um, tomorrow morning. I go, sure. So I go and at that time he was living at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. So he's obviously got the penthouse suite. So I go up to the penthouse suite and I figure before I get there, what, it's only gonna take like 40, 45 minutes for him to tell me basically the story of, of this of this film. I walk out three hours later. Why? It's because he's showing me all the stunts that he's going to do. <laughs> I am the only one in that room and Jackie's saying, okay, now I am going to, I am going to flip over and I'm going to take this chair and throw it in the air and then I'm gonna twirl it. And he's talking to me with, with his back right here and his legs going like this, twirling the chair. And he's going, okay, Nathan, now I'm going to kick the chair up and smash it against the wall. Boom, boom. And he does. And it just shatters into like a thousand pieces. And this is Jackie with just me standing there going. <laughs> it was incredible. When I left, it was almost like it was World War III. I mean, it was, it was just a mess in that penthouse suite. The other story I want to tell you very, very quickly is in Beijing. He calls me again. He goes, hey, I, I need to get together with you. I go, okay. So he gives me the address. And, and at that time, I didn't really know Beijing that well. I still don't know it very well, but I didn't recognize the address. So I take the taxi, and I'm still looking at the address. And I give the money to the taxi, and he drives away. And I look, and I'm, I assume that I'm going to be standing in front of a hotel, you know, like the Four Seasons, really tall. I go like this, and then I go like this, because it's just a two-story building. Not only is it two stories, but it looks like a condemned building, because there's a glass door that I was walking towards, and there was a chain link, what do you call it, a chain link, that, that, that enclosed the, the, the two things that uh, you, you're supposed to open the door with, right? And I'm kind of pulling and tugging, and also I was looking inside, and it was totally dark. And then all of a sudden, there was this old man who comes around the side and goes, Ni shi wang zhong xian? And he says, are you Nathan? I go, uh-huh. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> So I go in, and I'm thinking, he's going to kill me. <laughs> this, it, it really looked like a condemned building. It was so dark. And then we start walking across the lobby. There's no lights. And I notice as I walk, there's like poof, poof, poof. It's like, what is it, the, um, the guy in Charlie Brown, you know, with the, with the dirt? Thank you, yeah, pig pen, right? Yeah, every step that I take, there's a lot of dust coming up. And I'm just following him, and then he pushes the, the elevator button, and then he runs away. The door opens, and I get in, and I go, oh, God, I'm going to get killed. I know I'm going to get killed. I take it up to the second floor, and the elevator door opens, and Jackie is just standing there laughing his face off. I got punked. I got punked. 
Apparently, Jackie, and don't tell him I told you this, he lives in that hotel. But the second story, where he is, is spotless. It's his place because he doesn't like to stay in the Four Seasons. He doesn't like to stay in these other, you know, these penthouse places when he's in China because everybody recognizes him and wants autographs. So he, he found a condemned building. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> So we are almost out of time. I have, I can take one more question. Uh, so you're right here. I saw a wonderful offer 20 years ago. It was fantastic. And, and I want to know what you have done. Is it the same? Is it different? How has this one changed from the original, which was just perfect? Well, the main thing is that it's in the Chinese garden, <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of being in a theater like this. And to have it in the garden, which is so incredibly beautiful. Um, there are some other things that are different. Uh, obviously, the rear screen projections that we, we spoke about. But, and I forgot to mention this earlier, uh, you know, when I talked about some of the clothes that my grandfather and father had scavenged, the production actually bought some of them. So a lot of the costumes are being made from things from old Chinatown. So it's a and and as far as the music, the music isn't really changed. But to be in this atmosphere of the garden and to be outside, and I'll just say kind of parenthetically, this was supposed to, Nathan was supposed to be the artist in residence in 2020. This opera was supposed to be in the garden in 2020. A little thing called COVID came along, supposed to be there last year, another delay, but actually, and now here we are three years later, and it's finally happening. But that actually has given us all, the whole production team and LA Opera and the Huntington, time to really think about this production in a very different way um, from that, that one from 20 years ago. What would you say differently? Absolutely. It, it hasn't changed from a music standpoint at all. Thank you both so much. I'll go to the